Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. The world's largest biodiversity summit was due to take place this week in Kunming in China, but it's been postponed once again because of the global pandemic. In a year which has been dominated by COVID, we'll be looking at the future of the world's wildlife and its fundamental link to the fate of the planet. How do we stop repeating the mistakes of the past? I'll be speaking to the UN's Executive Secretary on the Convention of Biodiversity, Elizabeth Marema. As this year's host of the 15th Conference of Parties on Biodiversity, what role does China have to play in shifting the tides of mass extinction? And the African Wildlife Foundation explains why some of the continent's species are facing unprecedented levels of extinction, despite being home to a third of the world's biodiversity. Yet again, the biggest biodiversity summit in over a decade has been pushed back as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. COP15 in Kunming will now take place in October 2021, a full year after the original date. Leaders were due to convene in May with the aim of reaching an agreement over targets to protect the natural world. Some of these targets included conserving 30% of the world's oceans and land by 2030, introducing controls on invasive species and reducing plastic pollution. It all sounds good in theory, but just how realistic are these goals? Are they attainable? Last year, the world was stunned when the United Nations reported that world leaders had failed to meet a single biodiversity target agreed in Aichi in 2010. Determined to prove that Kunming would yield better results, the UN Convention on Biodiversity published a 20-point draft outlining the details of the agreement in January. But many say it still doesn't go far enough. Scientists say humans are causing the sixth mass extinction event in the history of planet Earth. And at the 2020 World Economic Forum, business leaders said biodiversity loss was the third biggest risk to the world in terms of likelihood and severity, behind only climate action failure and weapons of mass destruction. The forum delegates put their biodiversity concerns ahead of infectious diseases, terror attacks and interstate conflict. So it's not just Greta Thunberg who's worried. The 2030 goals are part of the UN's long-term plan to ensure that humanity is living in harmony with nature by 2050. For now, though, it's just a plan. The next few years will prove what these words are really worth. Well, join me from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, is the woman who will be leading this year's COP15 in Kunming, Elizabeth Maruma Marema, the Executive Secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. So welcome back, Elizabeth, to the agenda. Um, you're in Nairobi at the moment, but you should be in Kunming. Are you disappointed? <laughs> Not really disappointed. I think that all... Everything has a reason. Uh, we know why we are not in coming uh, at this time. We should have been there last year, uh, but that did not happen because of the COVID uh, pandemic going on. But that disappointment is not there because while we missed our COP, uh, we have had both positive and negative uh, uh, impacts, one would, uh, would say. Negative because not only our conference of the parties has been delayed, but all international conferences have been have had to be postponed. And the ongoing global economic recession has affected the, our meeting Vega, as well as resources for the effective implementation of our conventions or decisions taken uh, by the parties. But on the positive side, the period has created an uh, unprecedented awareness of the impacts of human actions on our nature. It has also increased understanding of the importance of biodiversity issues. We have seen increased ambition and commitments uh, on biodiversity conservation, and there are examples uh, for that. We have uh, also, the time has given us more time to prepare for our conference of the parties when it takes place, hopefully, 
later this year in October. Uh, and you believe that's been to your advantage in, in getting your ducks in a row, in a way, and having more time to prepare yes. for, for, for October. Um, but, I mean, if it is working to your advantage, do you think your targets that were going to be set in May will change uh, for October? The targets will not change so much, but they, there, there will be increased emphasis on some. For example, targets related to healthy issues, related to species uh, because of the lessons learned as the result of the ongoing pandemic. Probably we might see more emphasis on those as the countries negotiating are also all locked down as the result of the pandemic. So there might be some emphasis in some areas as the result of the pandemic, but overall, I think the targets uh, will still be the same. Well, because the same. I mean, the reason I ask is because um, I, I, I was wondering whether the targets, the goals, will change, because none yes. of the goals set in 2020 have been reached, have they? The targets 2020 have not been reached. Only some progress made, but virtually none of the targets has been fully reached, unfortunately. So the new targets are actually building upon uh, those uh, targets not reached 2020. They are also uh, building on the lessons learned from the targets not reached so as not to repeat the same one might say, quote and unquote, mistakes, if any. And therefore, also further uh, scale up where limited progress has been made. So how are you going to ensure, Elizabeth, that the targets yes. that you set, the goals that you're still setting, and finessing, if, if, if I'm right in understanding, finessing slightly the targets, how will you be sure those targets are reached? And secondly, Will you be able mm. to uh, perhaps uh, start or set more accountability for countries failing to meet those targets? One of the reasons why the last targets could not be reached was the actual implementation of those targets for a number of countries began after three, four, five years uh, into the decade. So much as we are saying, uh, there were 10 year target. In practical terms, there were actually six and five for many countries. Why? Because for a number of countries, they actually took a step back and began reviewing or others developing new national biodiversity strategies and action plans. So that is one. Two, which made us, uh, made the previous target implementation poor, is that there was expectation that those targets were to be implemented only by governments. Clearly, that was a lesson learned because you need all biodiversity is for all, including you and me. So implementation is also for all. Be indigenous peoples, local communities, be it the youth, uh, the business, the finance, the banks, all need to participate in the implementation. On accountability, unlike the previous targets, the current targets will be accompanied by accountability, transparency, review monitoring framework, which actually was also discussed last week at the ongoing scientific uh, uh, subsidiary body meeting. So this accountability framework, again, we hope that also other stakeholders will be ready and agree to also be accounted. OK, so what about... Give me some examples of countries that are reaching their targets. They're good examples to the rest of the world. To mention specific countries, uh, currently I will, I will not be able... I mean, I don't have... Uh, I understand. Them, uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to show favouritism? <laughs> <laughs> no. But if one goes to our Global Biodiversity Outlook, the fifth edition, which was launched in September last year, we'll see the countries which uh, have done more progress than others. Because okay. the report is big and is detailed. However, in terms of generic terms, I can say, for instance, when it comes to the agreed level of protection for land and sea, 
we moved from 10 to 15 percent terrestrial and three to seven percent marine areas. So this is okay. the kind of progress uh, generic which has been made by the specifics are in that report. I understand your hesitation in naming countries. You've named areas, which is very <laughs> clever and a very good idea. Ho hopefully, we'll know more in Kunming. Um, just uh, yes. finally, uh, Elizabeth, what has been most or one of the most interesting aspects of, of COVID and the pandemic um, and lockdown is people saw nature returning to cities. Do you, has that sparked some ideas about biodiversity, do you think? Yes, perfectly. And this is what some of the positive impacts of the pandemic. One, uh, particularly now you have mentioned the cities, the city populations have realized the benefits of nature to their well-being. We have seen now people uh, going more to the parks for a walk. Uh, we have seen the animals walking around the cities. And of course, uh, us being locked in, we appreciate seeing those animals and finding ourselves uh, more comfort and connection into the nature. And of course, this situation has enabled also the population calling on their governments and decision makers to make nature a priority as they're rebuilding back better after the COVID. Also, studies have shown that nature reduces anger, fear, and stress. And you can imagine, these are the issues individuals are facing as the result of lockdown. So getting out to the nature has reduced or tend to reduce this uh, hormone uh, stress yes. uh, coming in as the result of those but, frustration and stresses. You know, so nature is important to our physical well-being. I can't imagine, Elizabeth, you ever being angry or stressed, but uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Maruma Marema, many thanks to you for joining us on the Agenda again. Thank you very much. Still to come here on the Agenda, I'll be speaking to the African Wildlife Foundation about how to ensure governments follow through on their commitments to nature. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Agenda. The 15th Conference of Parties will, of course, take place in Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province. China is home to 10% of the world's plant species and 14% of its animals. But can it act as a global champion of biodiversity? Joining me now from Beijing is Dimitri de Boer, chief representative of Client Earth in China. Um, Dimitri, how crucial is China's role in the fight against biodiversity loss? China plays an incredibly important role, uh, not just uh, as the host of COP15. Uh, China is also uh, a very large country, and uh, it's sort of in the middle between uh, you know, the, the global north and the global south when it comes to the, uh, the geopolitical dynamics uh, around uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental governance uh, for the whole world. And so uh, you see that in, in the climate change negotiations, and it's similar in the, uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, negotiations. As somebody who's lived in China for a long time, how ready is the Chinese public to accept a low-carbon lifestyle? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think the Chinese public is, uh, since the last couple of years, very concerned uh, about the environment. 
and uh, especially issues like air pollution uh, and uh, water pollution and sort of the, uh, you know, whether the, the food supply chain uh, is actually um, free from pollution. We're seeing a lot of excitement in China now around uh, carbon neutrality and peaking carbon. Uh, it's just that a lot of people on the street don't quite know what that means yet. Uh, that's quite a big, a big difference between uh, you know, the average person in, in Europe, let's say, or the average person in China. Uh, but I think all of that is going to change in the next year or two. How important then is world opinion about China's coal-fired uh, power sources to changing the mindset about a future based on fossil fuels? It matters. Uh, it matters. I mean, obviously, China decides, uh, uh, you know, about big issues like this in a way that's uh, in the best interest of China, of, the China, of China and its population. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fact that uh, other countries are, are, extra, are very concerned about this and, you know, China wants to be and, and is increasingly uh, playing, uh, you know, a positive role and in, in, um, a leading role even in, uh, uh, in, in the global uh, fight against climate change. And so, um, you know, right before President Xi announced uh, the 2060 carbon neutrality target, the EU and China had just uh, agreed to establish a high-level dialogue on climate change and, uh, and the environment. And that sort of sent a signal that China, uh, you know, goes into this to, with, with the world, but also holding hands uh, with the European Union on it. And if COP15 goes ahead, uh, in October. What is the best outcome you could foresee out of that? Well, uh, you know, the simple, the headline target that I think we can all understand is that we hope that 30% of the whole planet uh, should be protected by 2030, so that the whole world agrees that in the next uh, nine years, we're going to have to protect 30% of, of the globe. Uh, and that doesn't just mean uh, the land area, it also means uh, marine areas. And it's not just about setting a target either. You know, the past uh, targets for biodiversity that had been agreed on a global level have been not achieved again and again. And China really doesn't want to see that happen. So whatever is agreed in Kunming this year should actually be achieved by 2030. And that's the hard part. So. Uh, when it comes to implementation, you know, getting this to actually be implemented over the next couple of years, that is where, uh, uh, you know, when we're seeing progress towards that, you know, if we can really reverse this trend of nature loss around the world, you know, and by 2030 see a situation where this is all stabilizing and where nature is, is getting a, a break, you know, and then we can move forward to 2040 and 2050 where we make net gains in nature around the world. That is a very exciting prospect. Dimitri De Boer of Client Earth, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Thank you, Stephen. Of course, hundreds of delegates were due to be in Kunming now to make their representations and to try and effect some real changes. Amongst them would have been my next guests, Jia Chow and Frederick Kumar from the African Wildlife Foundation. Um, Frederick, first of all, the AWF was founded, what, 60 years ago, more than half a century ago. Why is it important, um, and why is it important to protect Africa's wildlife in particular? Well, it is important to protect Africa's wildlife, uh, particularly because Africa accounts for about a third of the world's biodiversity, um, and that's significant. Um, the second largest um, um, rainforest is in Africa, um, the Congo Basin, and that accounts for a significant carbon sink which provides the entire world with a global good, if you may. In a sense, it cleans up the world's lands um, for us. So Africa maintain its, maintaining its nature, it, it's really critical. And Jia Chow, what biodiversity projects is the AWF working on at the moment? So the biodiversity work AWF is doing um, is quite diverse and unique. Um, and I think can be summarized in three areas. Um, in terms of the wildlife uh, conservation, so AWF, we uh, train and equip the rangers to protect um, elephants, rhinos, and other wildlife populations. We also uh, partner with wildlife authorities um, in Africa to deploy sniffer dogs at airports and other uh, trafficking hotspots to combat the illegal wildlife trade. Um, in terms of um, conserving land and uh, promoting uh, community well-being, well uh, we work with different stakeholders 
on uh, protected area planning and also help communities to uh, build schools in remote parts of um, uh, Africa uh, where um, high quality education um, is lacking. And also at the policy and the advocacy level, uh, we proactively engage um, and advise African governments and the businesses uh, with recommendations for uh, conserving our natural resources. Um, and uh, in, a, in the meantime, we also engage um, our international partners um, like China, uh, European countries and the United States uh, towards uh, promoting inclusive um, one of best e economy um, in Africa. And Frederick, that's quite a wide ranging brief, isn't it? There's a lot of ground to be covered there for the AWF. Who should be responsible, do you think? Should that be environmental agencies, charities or governments? We have a big problem on our hands. And it's a problem that cannot be led by any one party. Um, in my opinion, um, we have a, um, a societal-wide challenge to restore nature and to um, ensure that nature is beginning to um, deliver consistently for people. So in that respect, I would say governments have a significant role to play in legislation, and but as well in, in prioritizing um, nature in the way that they develop. Um, and, 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 and as well, I will also say businesses and corporations have a significant role to play because they use nature a lot in their processes. And they need to, to understand that extracting from nature alone is not enough. They need to give back to nature so that nature can be regained and, and, and continue to provide its services. On, on, on the individual level, um, it's, it's critical for individuals, you and I, to also do something about it. Through our choices and through our actions, we can conserve nature. So, so it's a societal-wide challenge, and I think it's a societal-wide um, um, action is required at every level. And Frederick, again, we're, we're expecting major commitments to be made by countries when Kunming eventually goes ahead, hopefully in October. Um, is there a risk, though, of Kunming becoming yet another conference backed up by empty promises? How can you sort of make the game a bit tougher, do you think, in the autumn? Well, there are certainly is a risk. Over the last 30, de um, 30 years, three decades, we've had these, these meetings every decade. And, and nothing has um, concretely uh, come out of it. So there is a risk. But, but the, the point is that we are in a bigger mess today than we were 30 years ago. And if we do not do anything about it collectively, um, we collectively are jeopardizing our um, existence as humanity. And given the, the stakes are that high, um, something needs to be done differently. And I would suggest three things. Um, the first is that governments and politicians really need to commit, commit in ways that truly impact their national level plans. Um, the second big thing, and we, we learned from the past, is that these commitments need to be backed up by resources. Without financial resources to take forward these plans, then it's really virtually just on paper. It's not going to happen. Then thirdly, um, in addition to financial resources, we need to provide the necessary knowledge, skills, to drive these processes. Um, in some parts of the world, the, the resources and knowledge are, are just not there to transform plans into action. And the transfer of knowledge is critical for it to happen. So political will, financing, and knowledge and capacity are the three things that need to go alongside the promises that are being made. Do events, do you think, like COP15 go far enough to address the challenges currently facing our planet that you've talked about so eloquently? Well, Stephen, I think um, what events like COP15 do is that they mobilize um, uh, people and political will towards a common goal. And if you, if you notice, um, in the past few years, there has been a lot of activity um, by civil society to really bring awareness on the issues. Um, we almost all now know that um, nature is in a mess and that we are losing um, up to 50,000 species a year, which um, is alarming. Um, and that knowledge, we hope, will trigger changes at different levels. Um, but um, without those changes, it's not going to happen. So what then COP15 does, the convention does for us, is that it galvanizes political will to sign up to commitments. Then from there, we take those commitments down to countries, 
to then make those changes happen, hopefully with uh, societies, um, with businesses, and with local government. So it, they do matter. Um, and I think this one is critical um, because of the timing. Um, and just finally, uh, dear Chow, I understand AWF has been cooperating with China. What, what difference would you say China, China's contribution uh, has made so far or is making? Yeah, um, I think um, this, um, definitely the COVID-15 is an opportunity uh, for China to showcase its effort to protect biodiversity, uh, both at home and also abroad, through its vision of uh, ecological civilization and also the mechanism of uh, ecological redlining. So China uh, developed the ecological redlining approach, uh, which places areas with uh, essential ecological functions under mandatory uh, protection according to their level of uh, vulnerability. Um, so it currently covers about 18% um, of China's uh, land mass. Uh, this uh, approach helps to strictly um, preserve the ecosystems uh, within this area. And uh, in terms of um, mitigating the negative impact of industrialization on the environment and the biodiversity in China and around the world, so China has been um, trying to raise awareness among the companies to uh, comply with the standards of, of countries in which they operate um, through the Built and the Road Initiative um, International Green Development uh, Commission. Jia Chao and Frederick Kumar from the African Wildlife Foundation, thank you both for joining us on the agenda. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. According to the UN's fifth Global Biodiversity Outlook, released in September last year, human activity is continuing to destroy habitats right around the world, threatening to wipe out wildlife populations and also endanger human health and security. One million species of animals and plants were reported in 2019 to be in danger of extinction, but not a single 2010 target to prevent this from happening has been reached. The failure to reach those targets has been described as the lost decade for nature, a mistake that the head of the UN's biodiversity project, Elizabeth Morena, told us cannot be repeated. Yet, as we move forward to a point of no return, it does now finally seem there's been a shift of attitude towards biodiversity, at least in perceptions of the extent of the crisis. Maybe this is related to the unprecedented disturbances caused by the global pandemic, or simply that climate chaos events are now unfolding with an uncomfortable frequency. The wildfires in Brazil, a terrible hurricane season on America's Atlantic coast, or the widespread drought across Mexico. According to the World Wildlife Fund, saving nature means overhauling how we produce and consume food so that no more land is converted for agriculture or precious habitats destroyed. But what would achieving that mean for the expanding human population? And how would that impact on the people who currently live and depend on these landscapes? Or well, questions like those will continue to loom large over the postponed UN biodiversity talks in Kunming due for later this year. Although the pandemic has in many ways thrown the fate of the natural world into further flux, it's also shown that protecting nature's health is essential if we are also to protect our own. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, has COVID changed the way we work? We'll be looking at the future of the Home Office. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye.